to veil or not to veil? That is the question. What a strange image that runs through our scriptures this morning. It starts in our story from Exodus. When Moses comes down from Mount Sinai carrying the two tablets of the covenant in his hand, he didn't know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. Aaron and the Israelites knew. They could see that he was different. It showed all over his face. His skin, it was shining. And they were afraid to come near him. Have you ever had that experience? Where someone you know has clearly had some sort of a transformative experience. We might even call it a spiritual experience. And they're just different. They've changed. And it's a little unsettling. Even a little scary. What does this change mean? What does it mean for the other person? And what will it mean for me? What will it mean for my relationship with the other person who has changed? Radiance and glory in another person, these are most unsettling. But Moses called to Aaron and the leaders of the congregation, and they returned to him, and Moses spoke to them. The transformed person understands that this change is disturbing, so he's got to reach out toward them and let them know that there is something in him that they can still recognize, his voice. Just enough connection and comfort that they are willing to return to him. And Moses is strategic. He doesn't start big. He starts with a small group, just Aaron and the leaders of the congregation. He knows that building some trust there is essential to building trust across the whole community. When we're unsettled, it often takes someone we trust to say, it's okay to come closer. Moses got this important step. And having tended to this task of building trust well, which is really about meeting people where they are, and walking the relationship forward slowly, having built some trust that could ripple out, all of the Israelites came near. And Moses gave them in commandment all that the Lord had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. But it's hard to be face to face with glory all of the time. It's just a lot of energy to navigate. So when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take the veil off until he came out. And when he came out, he told the Israelites what had been commanded, and the Israelites would see the face of Moses, that the skin of his face was shining. And Moses would put the veil back on his face again until he went in to speak with the Lord. Moses knew when to veil and when not to veil. He understood that when it was just he and the Lord, it's full-on glory time. Receiving all that glory, drinking in all that glory, letting God transfigure you through and through. Moses knew that though unnerving, the Israelites needed to see that kind of glory. They needed to know that God can change us that profoundly. Moses knew that the people needed to hear all that God longed to say to them. And Moses understood the dance of putting the veil back on to give the people of God a chance to integrate that glory into themselves before going deeper into the process of transformation. This veiling and unveiling dance is good and necessary because full-on glory shatters us. And you've got to have some space to put the pieces back together into a new pattern. For Moses, for us, 
Having experienced glory, there is no going back to as it was before. This is what Paul misses. He sees the veiling as a problem indicative of the Israelites' unwillingness to hear and their hardness of heart. I think Paul misreads the Exodus story. I get that. Prior to reading the story this week, I had always misread it too. I'd always thought that Moses took off the veil when he went in to talk with the Lord, and then he put it back on when he came out to tell the Israelites what God said, because they couldn't handle hearing what God had to say. But that's not actually how the story goes. Moses comes out and talks to them face unveiled. They can hear what God has to say. They just need a little breather from all that glory to integrate what God has said before hearing the next piece. That's very different from hardness of heart. That's working with our very real human limitations when it comes to how fast we can move along the process of transformation. And truth be told, Paul understands that transformation is a process too. Hear again what he says to the Corinthians. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And all of us, with unveiled faces, seeing the glory of the Lord as though reflected through a mirror, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, the Spirit. All of us are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. We are continually being transformed, moving deeper into glory all of the time. And this is that peace that Peter has such a hard time with. He sees the glory. He sees Jesus' appearance change, just like the Israelites saw with Moses. And he sees how the veil between the realms lifts and how Moses and Elijah are right there with Jesus. Peter is riveted by the glory and he wants to capture it like lightning in a bottle and keep it right there. But glory isn't to be contained in some location or dwelling place or experience. Glory is the energy that radiates out when transformation is underway. Peter sees it, but he's not letting it change him. And we know this because while Peter was blown away seeing Moses and Elijah and Jesus talking with one another, he didn't tune in to what they were saying. They were talking about Jesus' departure that he was about to accomplish in Jerusalem. They were talking about the crucifixion to come. Transformation always involves letting something go, letting something die, shedding something. Peter wants to nail that glory down right there without letting the process keep moving toward the dying that will lead to resurrection. Peter is settling for vicarious glory instead of the glory that comes when we die and rise with Jesus. And God sees that Peter is too mesmerized by the experience. Peter has seen part of it, but not the fullness of it. It's just a little too much for Peter to take in the full implications of what is happening and what is being said. So a cloud came and overshadowed them. Thank you, fog. And they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. God veils Peter with that cloud to reorient him to the bigger picture. This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. Peter, you've got to understand that gaining your life is going to involve losing it. You've got to understand that rising is going to involve dying. 
You've got to understand that glory will change you through and through, and that is not an easy process. Peter, your new life is really going to mess with your old one. In time, you will understand just how costly and glorious all this will be. Peter needed some veiling to take in the fullness of all that was happening around him and to him. Peter needed some veiling to hear and integrate all that Jesus and Moses and Elijah and God were trying to tell him. God gets the dance that has to be done with us. So does Jesus. Veiling and unveiling. It's just the dance we have to do to be changed from one degree of glory to another. Too much glory can cloud our capacity to see. And paradoxically, entering the cloud can clear our sight, reorient us, help us to see things in a fuller way, help us to understand the whole and not just the part. You know, the story of the transfiguration goes on. The next day, Jesus and Peter and his companions come down off the mountain, and they are met with a crowd. A man calls out to Jesus about his son, his only child, who is seized by a spirit that just won't let his boy go. The man had begged Jesus' disciples to cast it out, but they couldn't do it. Oh, Jesus is frustrated. You faithless and perverse generation, how much longer must I be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. While he was coming, the demon dashed the boy to the ground. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the boy, and gave him back to his father. And all were astounded at the greatness of God. The disciples could only see part of the picture. They knew the power and glory of casting out demons. They had seen Jesus do it many times. But they missed the whole. They focused on casting out the Spirit, not engaging it. They only saw the Spirit. They didn't see a father, and they didn't see his precious son. They only got the glory part without the deeper transformation that was needed to make the whole whole. Jesus didn't simply try to cast out the unclean spirit and send it into the outer darkness. Jesus engaged it head on. Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit. And he healed the boy. And he gave the boy back to his father. Jesus healed and restored the relationship. When we only focus on the part, we can't heal the whole. Jesus got that. His disciples didn't. The deeper our transformation goes, the more we see the whole and not just the parts. The more we understand and embrace paradox, the more we're able to live in the tensions and see them as necessary pressures to pull us along the path of transformation. The deeper our transformation goes, the more we can move in the rhythm of veiling and unveiling, full-on mind-blowing glory and disorienting clouds that reorient our sight. To veil or not to veil? That may have been our original question. But the answer lies in knowing the importance and place of both. Transformation, transfiguration will always involve both.